Hi there, Jim with Smoky Lake Maple Products. Today we are going to cover the assembly of the Dauntless Arch. The Dauntless was introduced to the hobby maple industry over the summer, and it is the big brother of the, of the very popular Star Cat. Putting the arch together, the Star Cat and the Dauntless, I've put together a couple of dozen Dauntless arches already, and it's something I really enjoy. So I'll show you all the parts. Now keep in mind, when you get your Dauntless delivered, the parts will be unpainted. You will get all the paint furnished with it. It's pretty much impossible to send the unit as it is painted because just shifting around and vibrating uh, in delivery. Uh, you're gonna scratch the parts. Off and you can't have that. It has to look perfect. And it will look perfect when you get done putting it together. So for the sake of um, expediting a, a practical video, we, we have the parts painted ahead of time. We're not painting them on camera. You don't need to see how to do that. But all the paint is supplied. You'll get four cans of this paint. And this is the same exact paint that we use on all of our evaporators, even our bigger commercial evaporators. We don't necessarily always get it in a spray can like this, but it's the exact same formula. And this is built just for us. This, this paint is formulated uh, just for the, the high temperature, the, high temperature in the, in the atmosphere of a, that, a, that a maple syrup evaporator typically sees. There's some areas of the arch that should be painted, and there's other areas of the arch that don't need paint, and there's even one area of the arch where we don't really want paint. So um, we're gonna cover that extensively as we put the arch together too, but as I introduce all these parts, I will also touch on that. So this is the base. There are two of these, they are identical. There's a left and right, and it might be easier to continue looking back at this example on the floor. The base is the part that makes the, 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 the base halves are the part that go on the bottom. This is the floor. It's really hard to see this on that arch, but it is the main floor of the firebox. The only part that really needs to be painted on this is this front lip. Okay. And I take care to paint all the way under that radius as well. Okay but that's literally the only thing that is ever gonna show on this. Is there a lip on the back? Yes, there is, yep, and painted the same way. This is the side panel. Side panel. The left and right side panels are also identical, so they, they are interchangeable. And we have a rear and a front. Okay. And this is a weldment that comes to you all set to go. There's obviously, we're not expecting you to do any welding. It's just bolting together. Um, this is going to be just like putting the Lego set together. Everything is so perfect. Everything is included. Yeah, we're not painting the, the inside of these panels. Inside later on, we're even going to cover how we insulate. You'll see the insulation is going to cover all of the surface. The loading door. Okay. And that is also painted just on the outside. Okay. We have the draft slide. This will make sense on how this works later on. But this actually allows you to turn the, to, to close the draft in case you need to kill the fire. This allows you to restrict the, the air going into it. And that you're painting just the tip? Yeah, so this, this is the part that you actually need to avoid painting uh, one area. You really want to avoid painting this, these edges right here. Later on you'll see where this actually slides in between two pieces of metal. And we avoid painting that only because at, at temperature, at operating temperature, I fear that, that that paint may become gummy and at some point if it collects any grit from your ash or whatever, it could make the draft door hard to slide. Hasn't really been a problem on the Dauntless at all, but it's something I, I'm mindful of. The fire grate assembly, this is by far the heaviest part of the entire unit. Does not get any paint, no paint. No paint, no. Um, there is a front and rear on this. This will be covered in the video too on how this goes in with fire brick too. These two areas, these two parts are what create the bed area inside the arch. That's another thing that sets the Dauntless apart from other hobby evaporators. This actually does have a bed area inside. It actually has the arch geometry, which makes it fuel efficient. It, it's, this, is, this is actually a very important part on an evaporator this size. So, Like you're talking about like a ramp that goes up and forces heat up against the pan. Correct. Correct. Yeah, some of the other hobby evaporators out there, um, they, they either have nothing or they expect you to build that with fire brick or something, but this is much more exact and it's really well done. This allows you to get insulation right up under the pan. 
Also included is stack pipe. There's actually four pieces here that are uh, inside one another. That's just the latch handle. The elbow is actually, it'll come to you in straight form like this, but you'll actually uh, transition that into Just give it a twist. Way. Yep. Okay. And this is all heavy gauge uh, steel stove pipe. Insulation as well. The insulation, mm -hmm. all of your one inch thick insulation is going to come with it. That's not an add-on. That comes right with your, your arch. That's going to be in those same two boxes. Great. So your hardware kit. Great. It's going to have every nut and bolt and screw that you need. I have the ones that we're using today laid out already. So these four bolts and these fender washers are used to hold the insulation inside the door. And I have these set aside. Don't confuse these two washers with the rest of these washers. These are stainless steel washers. They are a similar size. The stainless steel washers are very thin. They're actually used as a shim in your hinges so that when you open and close the door, you don't scrape paint off of the the, uh, the two parts of the hinge. That's you know, their only purpose. So okay. keep those aside. They are uh, for specific use. Then we have the three quarter inch carriage bolts, half inch carriage bolts, the bulk of standard washers. These are all quarter inch washers, quarter inch lock washers, and quarter inch, uh, quarter 20 nuts. Great. And then we also have the uh, emblem that goes on the front. The okay. emblem has its own hardware included. I'm going to okay. leave that in the bag for now. Okay. And then we also have a guy support. This is what gets bolt clamped to the, the chimney pipe. And from there you can tie wires or um, whatever you want cables down to the ground. In case you do set up in your backyard, that gives you means of supporting your stack. Anchoring pipe. it. Yeah, anchoring it, yep. Just a couple quick tips for you when you're painting your arch. Be sure to keep the spray can 12 to 15 inches away from the part that you're spraying. Also, make sure to do three light coats instead of one heavy coat. A spray paint demonstration is available at the web address on the screen. Tools. Today I'm going to use a, a small impact driver for part of this. If you choose to do that, uh, just be careful. These are surprisingly powerful. They can occasionally uh, break some, some of the quarter inch hardware. So, uh, I have that. so don't over tighten. I have just a combination screwdriver. I have an adjustable wrench. And I also have a 7 16 and a half inch box end wrench. Okay. Another thing we'll use a little bit is going to be a rubber mount. Great. For some spacers, I like to have two nickels and two dimes. Uh, you can actually use some of these washers as spacers, but uh, we'll get into what those are used for later on. Are we ready to get started? Let's do this. First thing we're going to do is we're going to make a box out of the front and the rear and the two side panels. So the top and like the firebox part, the not the base. Part, yep. These side panels in the front. The door we're not going to deal with until near the end. Okay. Let's so. do it. So today is the first day of December. And we had uh, our first major snow. In fact, it's still snowing right now. We had our first major snow overnight. We got about six inches. We're definitely going to be plowing tonight. Oh yeah, yeah, we're definitely going to be plowing the parking lot here at the shop and we'll have to plow it home. So here is where the rubber mallet may be used. Um, like I said, this all fits very, very precisely. These are quarter inch square holes mm -hmm. that accommodate the carriage bolts, okay? When this goes together, they need to line up. So in this case here, I need to very gently, you could get by without a hammer, of course, you could keep on wiggling it back and forth, but. I'm tapping this, this front panel down until my holes line up perfectly, and I'm, I'm there. Okay, is there anything special about this down here? Nope, that's nope. all. I'm gonna get one bolt in on top here. See, it slid right in all the way. That's what you want. I'm very, very particular when I put anything together. 
And if you look at any um, commercially built washer, they're stamped, so you'll have a nice rounded radius on one side. You'll have a sharp edge on the, on the other face of the washer. I always put that, that sharp face against the metal. It looks better. Yep. Now, most of these washers will never be visible. I know they're in there. <laughs> so I, I automatically, when I'm putting something together, I automatically grab the washer that way. So it'll have a washer and then a knot, right? Uh, it'll have a washer, that's a good point. It'll have a washer and a lock washer and then a nut. Washer, lock so washer, I'm nut. I'm gonna get that in there. So here's the combination. Washer, sharp face down, lock washer, and a nut. And that's typically how I hold them in my fingers when I'm putting them together. So it just all goes on at once. Okay. It looks like you're hand tightening them right now. Is that? Yeah, that's, that's all I'm doing for now, yep. Um, and I'm gonna get all five of these on this face. Now that I have the top and the bottom one in, the other ones are gonna line up perfectly. They have no choice, everything is, everything is dictated by these two already being in. And this gives it a very nice look. I should add that you can also choose to paint this unit at the end. Like when you're done assembling all the unpa unpainted steel parts, you could then paint everything. The reason I do it this way, the reason I paint all these parts ahead of time is because I like the look. I like the way this black matte finish looks against these chrome, uh, this chrome hardware. Yeah, that looks sharp. Yeah, it, it adds a lot and it's worth it. It's certainly faster and easier and you use less paint if you were to paint it all at the end after assembly, but then all this hardware would be painted black and it wouldn't look quite as good. But that is up to each individual. There's plenty of paints. If you paint everything the way I described it at the beginning of this video, you'd probably have most of a can left over, if not a complete can left over. But in any rate, you'll have plenty of paint. And I think this paint is also available on our website, Ange, too, right? If you yes, it is. Uh, if you search for arch paint, it'll show up. Yeah, so if you ever need to touch up or use this stuff for any other purpose, it's there. The impact does not fit in every single place of this assembly. Where it does fit, it will save us some time. One cool thing is that people could actually be setting their Dauntless up right alongside next to us. Yep, so. right, right during this video, you could be putting your Dauntless together as we as we talk here. And we'll probably talk some maple and and so forth. Probably solve some of the world's problems. As we yeah, why together. not? Yeah. <laughs> um, it seems to me to take about an hour to put these together. I can probably shave a little bit off if I'm just concentrated and putting one together. But um, if it's your first one, or if I'm doing a demo video, I wouldn't be surprised if it takes a little bit longer than an hour. We'll see. Mm -hmm. So these two, that side panel and the front panel, both have a lip on them that overlap there. I bet that adds a lot of strength. Yeah, and that's something I should have mentioned. You bet. We uh, we have that, that lip formed on the side panel. Should we look at the back? Yeah, why don't you? The side panels have a lip formed on, and so do the end panels. So you can imagine having those two formed edges overlapping one another. You can imagine how strong that makes everything. And yeah, it's worth it. It's, that's cool. It's worth that effort on our part to make such a strong assembly. You know what else is cool that I'm really proud of is that all these parts were made in America. Everything. Every single part of the arch and the pans is made right here in Wisconsin, USA, out of USA material. There is not a single part of this that, that is uh, foreign made. I'm very proud of that. And I know uh, we've gotten a lot of feedback. We introduced the Star Cat, the little brother of this thing. Mm -hmm. We introduced the Star Cat pretty late last year. We didn't introduce it until the end of January or early February, but we sold about a hundred units before uh, before maple season ended for everybody. And we got a lot of feedback on the Star Cat. People loved it. And one of the things people did love about it was putting it together. They actually enjoyed assembling it with their 
with their daughter or son or their, their granddaughter or grandson. So that really added to it for a lot of people that added to the, to the enjoyment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maple syrup is a family activity. It's kind of cool that you could put the arch together too. Yeah. But also just to have everything that you need all in one kit instead oh, yeah. of trying to cobble something or no messing around. Yeah. <laughs> if fire brick didn't weigh two pounds each, we would include the fire brick in the package. But in some cases, it's it's practical to buy your fire brick locally. So we wanted you guys to have that option. We have it here too. We'd be happy to send it to you. Yeah. People like having options. Yep. Um, so the fire brick that we use is four and a half by nine by one inch, right. and it's a high temperature fire brick. Yeah, it's, it's actually the, the bricks we have here are actually a uh, industrial grade fire brick. Not to say your regular wood stove or fireplace brick wouldn't work, but um, for, especially for our commercial evaporators that see really really intense heat, um, the industrial fire brick holds up better for us. Yeah. And what is the purpose of fire brick? Do you want to talk about that? The only purpose for the fire brick is to protect the ceramic insulation. The fire brick isn't actually all that uh, effective of an insulator. That's why you use it in your wood stoves or in your fireplaces at home is that it allows the heat to pass through and heat your house. So the ceramic insulation in the Dauntless is what keeps the heat in where you want it. You want you know, the only place you want the heat to escape is through your pan. You want it to boil sap. So the ceramic insulation is in place to, to insulate. The fire brick is in place to protect the ceramic insulation. Mm -hmm. And that's why you'll see the fire brick at the end. You'll see the fire brick is only used where we need it. It's not all throughout. Well. Mm -hmm. But we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Yep. So the front face is completely bolted on. Okay. And you can take a look at that now if you'd like. All so right. these are the, this is the hardware we just assembled. Very and you can good. see the overlapping lip inside here too. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Okay. So why did you name it the Dauntless? What's that all about? Well, almost, almost all of our evaporators have been named after uh, American World War II fighter or bomber aircraft. So the Dauntless served in World War II um, it, it, not exclusively, but mostly in the, in the Navy as a dive bomber in the Pacific. So. I believe it got its first action at Pearl Harbor when we were attacked. Yeah, I am not completely sure. I, I really... Uh, yeah, that's if you... That's a Wikipedia. <laughs> Is that a Wikipedia? <laughs> um, all of our evaporators have been named after World War II aircraft, except for the Starcat. The Starcat was... Named after my best little friend, my little orange cat. Uh, we lost about a year ago. So yeah. it was dedicated to her. So the back plate is going on similar to the front. It's exactly just putting the, the carriage bolts on and making yep. sure the holes line up. Same and... exact hardware. Yep. What separates this from the Star Cat also, in addition to having that ramp on the inside, the bed, um, is that you can have that drop flue pan set where the star cat, you just have a divided or a flat pan. Right. And it's probably always going to be that way. I don't see, I don't see building a flue pan for the star cat to be all that practical because it's not all that expensive to upgrade to the Dauntless if you did need more productivity. <laughs> So just for people who don't know, what makes a, a drop flue pan set so much more efficient? Yep, so the, a drop flue, the, the drop flue term, that applies to the rear pan. And if you look inside of a rear pan, you actually see that there's uh, dropped cavities that the sap sits in. So the sap sits in these flues, and then the fire and exhaust is channeled through the bottom side. 
So it exposes your sap to a ton more surface area, like three times more surface area. That's what makes them so fuel efficient and so productive. This pan set here will evaporate nearly double the amount of sap in a given amount of time that either of these two will. These two are about the same as one another, about 10 gallons an hour or so. And so this one would be how much? That one is, uh, you know, 15 to 20. Um, just because there's so much more surface area, surface area coming in contact with the flames. Right. But you would still fill it two inches above the flues. And... Yep, operating depth of the, of the dauntless pan, no matter what pan system, no matter what pan system you choose, operating depth is about two inches. So in a flue pan, that means two inches above the flues. So with our StarCat, we sold a lot to schools and nature centers and um, people who were really interested in starting small programs or mobile programs, mm -hmm. which I thought was really neat. Um, who have we, have we sold any to nature center, any Dauntless to nature centers? I'm not sure if we have yet or not, but over the summer when the, when the Dauntless was still being perfected and tested, the StarCat continued to sell to those smaller programs. Um, That's really cool. Yeah, even during this, the off-season, the StarCat has had pretty steady sales. We've even sold the StarCat, and I expect, I suspect the same thing's going to happen with the Dauntless. We sold many of those units to people that already run big maple operations. They wanted to have the StarCat sitting outside for, for their kids to run or to have the public, uh, to give the public an opportunity to run an evaporator. So even when someone's running a big multi-thousand tap operation, we've sold many of those little star cats to those people. Yeah. Which is cool. That's a lot of fun. There was a lady here the other day who was just so excited that she was able to pop it in the back of her SUV. And... Yeah. <laughs> Fit it. Yeah, and, it, and it's the, the star cat and the Dauntless solves a big problem for a lot of people. A lot of people... They're, they're tired of boiling on the turkey cooker or, or whatever they've been doing for so long. When they finally find the StarCat or the Dauntless, they finally have a high quality solution. They have something that is cost effective. It doesn't break the bank. These are, uh, as of now, this Dauntless sells for uh, $1,299 shipped to your door. So this is December 1st of 19. So for under $1,300, shipped right to your door, and you don't need a lift gate, you don't need a, no semi is gonna come. This is going by UPS ground or FedEx ground. They drop it right at your door. Um, so for not even $1,300, it's quite a value. It, it's hard to build anything yourself for that amount of money, and that includes your pan, your, your flat pan at that price, that includes literally everything. Uh, the only thing you have to add to it is your 18 fire bricks, which you can buy anywhere. Mm -hmm. I wish I would have had a Dauntless or a Star Cat when we first started. That would have saved us a, a lot of trouble. Yeah, yeah it would have saved but us then, a sinus infection. And yeah, but, <laughs> but then we might not have started a business. True. Yeah, we started on a just an open campfire at our cabin in Smoky Lake. Well, I mean... The town is called Iron River, but it's nestled in between two lakes, Big Smoky and Little Smoky. Yep, on Smoky Lake Road. In on the, Smoky Lake Road. In Iron River, yep. Those were some great times. We had neighbors that would come over. We had people stopping. Well, when we, when we got our um, drop flu, when we got our drop flu evaporator, like in subsequent years, we would kick off so much steam that people would stop and... Ask us if our woodshed was on fire. Yeah, they mis mistook the steam. <laughs> we had a lot of people checking on us because because we made so much steam, and on a on a damp, cold day, that steam would, would be going out all the way to the road. Yeah, that was a lot of fun, though. We had a lot of neighbors that let us tap on their land, and that was great. And now, so up in Iron River, Michigan, we got up to a point where we're around like 800 taps. 800 or 850 or whatever it was. And we were selling syrup. That was the business. That's where the name Smoky Lake Maple Products actually started. 
And uh, now we, I think last year we maybe had 300 taps, which was a lot for us. Normally now we tap 150 or 200 or so every year because as you can imagine, we're busy in the spring. Uh, we're busy distributing sure. evaporators and supporting them and filter presses and all the other equipment that we offer. That occupies all of our time in the spring. Right. So there's been years where we didn't make syrup. We just couldn't get away. Uh, we, we couldn't sacrifice the time. Our main priority is to make sure that everybody is taken care of and everybody has a successful year. And yeah. That's very important to us. And if we have time to make syrup, that's great. Yeah. And we're, as we get more and more help, we have a lot. Our crew is fantastic. There's, uh, I think there's about 15 of us total or somewhere around there now. And, um, you know, that really helped a lot. That allows Angela and I to have a little bit more time and freedom in the springtime. Well, yeah, we like to do demos. That helps people too. And... Yep, our crew joins us on uh, after work at night or in the weekends. We, we boil sap right here in the showroom. We, we take the sap from our woods at home, but all the boiling is done right here. And there's videos, look on YouTube. There's a lot of videos that, that cover our boils in here. Mm -hmm. We have a really popular video that uh, it seems like everybody has seen by now um, where we are running our two foot by four foot Corsair. The Corsair is a, a very, uh, it, it's a professional evaporator. We build it as small as two foot by three foot, but it's, uh, it's hard to call it a hobby evaporator because it is so productive. It's, just fantastic. Um, and there's a video of that evaporator, that 2x4 Corsair with high output pans evaporating 50 gallons an hour without preheating sap. So that's a video that it seems uh, you've gotten a it's lot been of popular. people have seen that. So cool, we got our firebox there. <laughs> yeah. So that is, uh, all the hardware is tightened. So that is that part is done. I'm going to set the base halves right next to each other. And this is pretty heavy metal. Um, so there's going to be a part during this video, and no matter how tough I feel, I'm probably going to have Angela help me. Um, so don't hurt your back. I mean, when you're putting this together, uh, you might want to have people, you know, help you toss these parts around. But for sure, when I get to a point where I'm ready to put this firebox on here, I'm going to have Angela reach out and give me a hand with that, just because, well, she's here. Because <laughs> why not? All right, so we're going to do the same configuration as we so, were before, right? Half inch is all we've used so far, the half inch length, the half inch by quarter carriage bolts. That's what we used. All 20 of them that we used so far on that assembly were half inch. And the place where we're going to use the three quarter inch is where there's three pieces of metal that we're bolting together. Mm -hmm. The half inch is not quite long enough to sufficiently bolt the three layers together, but the two layers, it's good enough. They're, they're long enough, I should say. My 7 16 box end does have a, a ratchet on the end. It doesn't fit in all places, but where it does fit, it helps. The impact would also work there as well. Those two bolts holding the halves together is all it takes to get these two pieces together. Now there's some other holes through the base you can see there in all four corners. We're not concerned with those during the assembly. That is just for bolting on the optional um, wheel kit that we have for it. We have a, a, an add-on kit, um, pneumatic tires or, or caster wheels that you can put on here so you can wheel it around. You can push it through a gravel driveway or, or whatever. So. Okay. That's what those holes are for. You're not concerned about those during the, during assembly. Now you do have to pay attention. This is the, the another part here that's not symmetrical. It, that could go on um, backwards. It's going to be concerning when we put this part on. But being that I have the loading door on that end, I'm going to make sure that I put the front toward that that side. So where the where the air vents are, mm -hmm. that's the front. halves will actually fit right inside of this. Okay. So the slide actually will go right here. 
So now you can see how that works. You can see the air vents yep. opening and closing. So it doesn't really matter what position you have this in for now. I'm going to put dimes in here. Because when we're done putting this together, we don't want that metal pinching it tight. Mm -hmm. we, we want this to be uh, pretty movable. So that just ensures when you put the nuts in, the carriage bolts, I mean, yep. that you're not pinching that damper slide. Exactly. To... When we're done assembling this, we want that damper to be very easy to move, just like it is here. Okay. Okay, just putting the edge of the dime in there because you don't want the dime to get swallowed up. And yeah, I want to be able to grab all the pliers or, or get it out later because it's going to be pinched in there. And I'll, I'll show you how to get that back out. Okay. So now is when I'm going to need your strength to help me. Okay. So what we're going to do, we're going to set this in. This lip right here is going to go on the outside of this. Okay, so our assembly that I just got done bolting together is going to drop right in here. And it's a perfect fit. So okay. Yep, there you go. That's perfect. Nice. Very nice, thank you. It fit in perfectly. And these four bolt holes now, we're still using the half inch long carriage bolts. So what makes a carriage bolt a carriage bolt? The, the square insert on the end. Okay, so when you put the bolt in, it's not like it's gonna spin when you're trying right. to... Right, that's why we don't need a wrench on each side of all this. We just need one wrench. It would be annoying to have a, a bolt spinning around as we as tried to tighten it. it. Yeah. And it would also not look as good. These look really, really nice. These rounded head look, heads look really good on here. So I guess that was my main objective, but it sure makes assembly easier too. So while we're putting this together, do you want to talk about firewood? Sure. What kind of firewood length should be cut for this? The uh, the firebox is 24 inches deep before we put fire bricks in. So a 24 inch log would probably still fit in the firebox, but it would have to be at a diagonal. I'd plan on cutting your wood at about 20 inches at the most. Okay. Um, if you cut your firewood the same way you cut it for most indoor wood stoves or fireplaces, you'll be all set. And uh, just as important as length of your firewood should be considered the the thickness, the girth. The, the girth of it as you split it, yeah. Um, big firewood like that you use in your wood stove, that's nice in a wood stove because it burns for a long time, you get a, a long burn time out of it. That's not what you want with a maple syrup evaporator, you want a lot of heat. To boil sap, you need a lot of heat, so if you want to reach, you know, 12 or more gallons an hour with this thing, your firewood is going to have to be split Perfectly. Like the size right. of your wrist. About the size of your wrist, yeah. Yep. And if you have very dry wood that's a little bit bigger than that, you'll be okay, but uh, make sure it's very dry. And uh, some people are surprised how, you know, they think that their wood is dry and seasoned, but it really has some moisture. So if you're burning your wood and you see any moisture coming out of the end, of the log that means your log is green yeah and it's not gonna kick out as many btus and we run into it every year you know we have people that are questioning why am i not getting um this gal this this evaporation rate that this unit should get and and i say well almost always it's because your wood isn't as dry as it could be and and they might say oh it's very dry i i cut it last uh I, I cut it last summer. Well, if it's oak, that's not very dry. Oak takes, I won't bring uh, oak firewood into the house or the sugar house for two years after I cut it. If I cut it green, minimum of two years drying time on oak. Um, ash is a firewood that dries very quickly. But multiple times, you know, I've, I've you know, troubleshooted with people and I said, you've got to try a different firewood. And when they get a firewood that's actually dry, they'll, they'll call me back and they say, wow, that made a huge difference. So 
the, the moisture content of your firewood is a, a major factor in the performance of any evaporator. One story that I'll share, um, a brand new evaporator, it was a two foot by six foot Corsair with forced draft. Now with the right firewood, that evaporator is capable of about 60 gallons an hour evaporation rate pretty easily. Uh, 60 would be very achievable. He was getting 20, 15 or 20, and they were running it at a, at a school down in southern Wisconsin. And they couldn't get it to perform, and I kept on telling them, you know, it, it almost has to be your firewood. There's only so many things that can be wrong. Um, brand new evaporator, and he swore up and down that this wood that was donated to him was, was dry, it was seasoned. The farmer that gave it to him guaranteed it was dry. So, finally, I encouraged them to come up here while we were boiling. This was during the season yet. I said, you know what, we're boiling tonight. Why don't you, why don't you come up here, we'll boil together. Whatever, whatever the problem is, we'll figure it out. And I said, bring an armful of your firewood too. So he did. He brought, a, he brought an armful of firewood in when, when him and his, his partner came into the showroom with us. And, and I looked at it and I could already tell by the lack of, of checking on the end of the log that it wasn't very dry. And he handed it to me, and I think it was mostly maple, maple and oak. It was heavy stuff. And, and I showed him our evaporator running. It had been running for a couple of hours by the time he arrived. And it was really boiling. Our two by four was, was processing at least 50 gallons an hour. And I said, now look at that boil in that evaporator and pay attention to what happens when I put your firewood in. And I proceeded. I, I put the firewood in that he brought, and the boil just went down to a simmer. And uh, it was an eye-opener for him. And it took probably an hour for that firewood to finally get out of my firebox, because it was so damp. Um, I couldn't wait for it to get out of there, but it, it, it was such poor quality wood that it, it stayed forever before it finally uh, burned away. And then I started loading my wood back in and it took off. It was like a jet that was just flying again. Mm -hmm. So when he left, um, we had fully diagnosed what the problem was. And when he left, I, I sent him with about a half a pickup truck load of our firewood. And uh, man, he never looked back. He had so much fun <laughs> boiling the rest of that season. So um, I noticed that these are nickels back here, and in the front we had dimes. That's correct. Does that matter where you get the nickel, where you put the nickels, Definitely. and where you put the? Why the, is the nickels in the back? And because that draft slide is only, it only goes to about here. Okay. And being that I have those dimes jammed in there right now, I'm not going to be able to slide that slide. We'll be able to do it in a little bit. Okay. But this right here is what stops it. It stops it from going back or forward. This is just the, the, the actuator, I guess. So that slide goes from here back. So the dime is the correct size thickness for the front. From the front. But back here, we don't have that, that extra layer of metal, which so is the slide. you need something thicker. So we use the nickels because they're thicker. Got it. And like I said, you could use different washers and things to shim it. It probably doesn't need to be as precise as I'm making it, but... Those two things work really well. I haven't been using the impact a whole lot on this project because we've been having a pretty good conversation, but uh, <laughs> it does it does add a a lot of um, a lot of convenience to it. Before I put all these bolts in, I just want to point out that. Now we're going through three layers of metal. When we put these side bolts in, there's a whole bunch of them on the sides. Okay, that's and, three layers. Yep, we have the base half, we have the floor of the arch, and we have the side panel. Now we're using three quarter inch bolts. Okay. And like any other part of the arch, once you get the first one or two in, the rest fit up pretty well. You'll see one trick that I, that I use on the, about the middle of this. I want to get that, uh, that dime lost in there. So. I've 
bring that right out to the edge. So uh, safety. Um, I guess having a, a fire extinguisher nearby might be helpful. Um, we also found it's really important not just to have it nearby, but to not just that you know where it is, but everyone else helping you knows where it is yeah. and how to use it. We, uh, yeah, not that we ever had to deploy it, but, um, I forget. Our friend, um, we have a friend out in Marshfield who has had fires on his property just because, you know, the leaves are dry and yeah, toward the end of the season when the snow is gone um, the threat the main threat is the embers that can come out of the smokestack that's the dangerous part i guess so you don't want to have this set up right next to your house right. or uh you just need to make sh and be mindful of the wind direction and things like that and an evaporator like the dauntless will be less of a threat than some of the bigger uh, commercial type of evaporators that have forced draft. The Dauntless does not have a blower inducing the draft. So it is going to be less dangerous in terms of creating fires outside your building and outside the smoke truck. But it's still something to watch out for though. A maple syrup evaporator is completely different than a wood stove. So don't think of it as if it's the same thing. A maple syrup evaporator makes way more heat. Than a, than a wood stove. Another safety item um, would be a extra just spare bucket of raw sap. Yeah, that's actually pretty important. If this is your first time running an evaporator, have a bucket of sap just sitting by by the side of the evaporator. Um, do you want to tell that story about um, one of our customers? Who asked his son, okay, I'm going to go out in the woods. Do you know what this bucket of sap is for? His father was leaving his son to run the evaporator on his own for the first time. And they always had a spare bucket of sap around. And, and as the father went out in the woods to, to work in the woods on sap lines and stuff, he said, now you know what that, that bucket of sap is for, right? And the son's like, yeah, I'm good, I'm good, I got this. And so the, the guy went out in the woods, did his work, and just as he came back up the driveway, he saw smoke coming out of the pans, not steam, but smoke. And just as he came up the driveway, he saw his son take that bucket of sap and open the door of the evaporator and toss it into the firebox. That's <laughs> not where it goes. That sap was intended to go into the pans in case there was a problem that, that was there to keep the pan from burning up. Yeah, so if the liquid level gets too low, that's um, your pan can overheat and scorch and warp and right. your syrup can be damaged. So that extra sap, if there's any kind of issue in the front pan or in the pan, the sap goes in the pan, That's right. not the firebox. Some people like to wear a face shield. It's probably a good idea. Um, absolutely a good idea to have gloves while you're handling the firewood and putting that in the firebox. Yeah, even if you have tough hands. Again, this isn't the wood stove. The evaporator is, a maple syrup evaporator is much hotter than a than a wood stove. Um, another safety item. A lot of people assume that this base here would be, oh, great storage space. Why don't I put, um, I don't know, more wood down there or whatever. Why don't I use that as a storage location? Well, don't because, see this damper? coals or whatever can get through that. Even when the grates are in place, of course the grates go there, but even when the grates are there, the some coals can fall through there. Not, yep. not very big ones, but they, it can happen. It can fall through there, so you don't want anything combustible under there. That's not meant for storage at all. I want to point something out here before I continue, and I need okay. you to come over here to see. Okay. I have bolts in all four corners now, mm -hmm. and uh, they're hand-tightened but because of the length of this firebox, even though these holes are precisely placed, the way this metal is formed, it is sometimes helpful. You can see that this is not quite lining up. If I try putting my bolt in, 
it'll go in, but it's just tight, okay? That it's it's not uh, it, it's very helpful if you take your screwdriver and just line things up like this on a hole right next to the one where you're putting your middle bolt in. See, by doing that, I'm able to get the bolt in much easier. So that's nice. just a little trick to be mindful of. That's smart. Yeah, so, and you can use anything for that. I use a, a bigger screwdriver that I can just kind of wiggle it back and forth. See, it's in all the way now. Um, you'll do that, get that bolt in the middle. The rest of these are gonna go much easier for doing that. Mm -hmm. And of course, you can just get the bolt through and then draw it through the rest of the way with the, with the nut and washer. But I like, to, I like the feeling of getting it in all the way and just tightening the nut behind it. And you can see now that I have that center bolt in, these go right in. There's no, no challenge to put the rest of them in. And I'm not tightening any of these yet. So some of the southern states, they already start looking at tapping at the uh, at the end of December or or uh, early early January. So uh, this video is coming in. It's it's high time for some of you guys to start thinking about this. And of course we have the the north the northwest part of the country, Washington and. And of course, Vancouver Island and all of British Columbia, they make maple syrup. Not too many people know that actually, but they make syrup. They make syrup out of their big leaf maple trees. And their season starts at the end of November or December, and it goes all the way through April. So they have a long season there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've actually visited sugar bushes out there. Yeah, we have, we have yeah. evaporators. We have actually some small commercial evaporators set up on the West Coast. I think that the West Coast is just a sleeping giant. And there's no reason they can't make syrup out on that West Coast because they're, they're big leaf maple trees. They're, they're testing out with substantial sugar content. They're, they're pretty much equal to our sugar maples or our red maples or, or whatever. They're, you know, they're big twos or even trees, just like we see. It's about the same. I'd like to um, just acknowledge our parents in this video too, how helpful they've been and supportive they've been of us in our business and all the work they do to help Smoky Lake succeed. Um, Jim's dad has done a lot of deliveries in the past and my parents have done a lot of uh, often these, these hardware kits where put together by my parents or... Yeah, they got some enormous help. I even have pictures yet of, of my dad back, when, I, back when, it, when the business started. And him and I were in the, the garage yet. That's where the business started. That's where a lot of businesses used to start. We were in the garage and he was uh, spot welding bag holders. Uh, that's really neat. And of course, uh, he's retired and he was retired back then already. But it would have been a, a harder thing to get business started without such support. And now my dad is 78 and he still makes some deliveries for us and uh, picks up parts. He's kind of a gopher once in a while for us. And what a mm -hmm. big help. So we're a couple days after Thanksgiving, but thanks parents. Yeah, thank you parents. And maple season for us is only uh, oh, about three months away now, so it's time to start getting excited for, for just about everybody. I think once it starts getting cold and snowy, people start thinking about it more and more. Yeah. So are there any other thoughts about the materials that you used to build this firebox? Why did you choose steel? Steel is, well, first of all, steel handles heat better than stainless steel. It's, uh, it's not practical to build a firebox out of stainless steel um, because of the cost anyway, but we use a good heavy steel. This is um, this is 12 gauge steel that we use. So it's a it's a heavy package. 
it's amazing, and I don't want to sit here and, uh, and bash any of my competitors, but I've seen some of the things built out of uh, just sheet metal, like sheet metal, like auto sheet metal, just so thin it's crazy. Um, so the thought of lighting a fire in something like that is... It just tends to flex a little strange, bit more. Yeah, but everything we do is is proper. I mean, this is a high-quality piece here. You can, you can see by the by the precise way that everything fits and the fit and finish is perfect all around. Even on a bolt together evaporator, we put a lot of emphasis on, on fit and finish. And like all of our evaporators, it's airtight. Insulated and airtight. It's the only way we do it. Yeah, I like to hear people say that they're gonna be passing this down through their family or, and there's no you know, they've to... got their grandkids involved or their kids involved. I love hearing that. This evaporator can last a lifetime. It can get passed down generations. Every March we have a video contest um, with a different theme. And every year we get videos, you know, people with their kids, the kids helping. It's just cool to see the kids doing something other than a video game. <laughs> You know, getting out of the house, being out in nature, and actually doing something and doing, you know, making something really cool. And that time of the year, we all need to get out of the house. It's after a long winter, and it just feels good to have a somewhat warm day to go out and just enjoy the woods and being outside. It's a celebration of spring for everybody. Yeah, for sure. A lot of our co-workers, they'd never made syrup before, but even they took to it. They, there's something about it that, uh, that is just so fun and rewarding. And it's together time. You know, people, it's, it's common here. We, we don't make syrup at a commercial level. We, we kind of turned into a party. We'll have food and drinks. A lot of times it's a big celebration in the showroom. That's what it's all about for us. So the cabin that... Um, we started where we started our business where we used to tap trees um, We no, no longer own that but we still have a lot of connection to that area because uh, We go back for the Phelps Maple Fest every year and help with their maple syrup contest and other things that they do We still have um, a lot of connections up there. We have a lot of friends up there. We made a lot of friends doing the, doing the maple syrup. Yeah before. but um, unfortunately with the business, we just didn't have the time to be driving up to the cabin. It was a well, three, three and a half hour drive for us, and one way, yeah. just one way. And oh, I mean, raccoons would break into the screen porch and then tear the screen porch apart, or you know, it was just so heartbreaking to see things fall apart. And, and we didn't have a chance to go there. Yeah, yeah so. We miss it. So what's the next step? The side bolts are all tight. I use the impact for that. Those are all tight, and now we I pull on this slide and I kind of wiggle that out. That's how I get the dimes out of there. Now because we had those shims in there, we have that nice, smooth, easy action. So now you can see what this, what this does back here. And later on, you're not going to be able to see that. When we're done assembling the Dauntless, you're not going to be able to see this, this stopper. Okay. And then on the back here, you use a pliers to pull these nickels out of here. And that's it. Great. So now, let's put that ramp on uh, together on the inside. We're back to using half inch hardware. If you have any three quarter inch bolts left, they're just spare. We have one left from our kit that is not going to be used. Yeah, everything's weighed, and then we error to the heavy side on the hardware, yeah. And we do hear from some people that they do occasionally break a bolt. It, it's, uh, it's not unheard of to break a bolt, but it's just quarter-inch hardware. Figure out what the, what's front and what's rear. The lip that has the holes on it goes toward the rear of the arch. Okay. And this riser... It's assembled toward the front of this bed. You can see all my holes line up here now. 
now I drop my bolts in. I'm going to get one started. And like I said before, the reason that the Dauntless is so fun to put together is because the fit up is so perfect. It, Everything's laser cut, so it's precise. Yeah. Everything's laser cut, it's perfect. There's never any grinding or filing. Or never any need to do that, not, not ever. So a half inch bolt, flat washer, lock washer, nut. That's right. All right, snug them up, because you're not going to get that those nuts ever again. This assembly drops into the Dauntless, like so. Now you see what those holes in a vertical pattern on the side of the Dauntless sides are for. Oh, right there. And again, it's a perfect fit. Let's take a look at how those holes line up. That's what makes this such a fun project. Kazam. So is there a certain pattern that you use to put all these bolts in? You just do one side, then another? Um, generally not. I, uh, I like to get them all in. In a lot of cases, when I put an assembly together. I like to get all the bolts in before I tighten any of them. And you can see that the sides of the shelf are supported because they fit right on this tapered sidewall. Oh, yeah, they the they have a shared taper. So when it's all set, this thing has supported the entire length too. It's really kind of a, 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 a neat design. It's, it's, everything is so perfect. Literally everything about the Dauntless, right down to the way it's packaged in the boxes we sent, is perfect. It all came together. Uh, I mean, it, it was like a slam dunk project. Everything is so perfect. The way it fits up, the way it operates, the way it ships is really, I couldn't ask for anything better. I'm just so proud of it. Seven sixteenths. Yeah, every uh, every piece of hardware, every nut we used so far was a quarter inch nut, so it required a seven sixteenths wrench or driver. And a lot of times, I will check all the hardware after I run it in with a nut driver, with an impact driver. I'll firm it up with a with a hand tool, just trying to prevent breaking them. And that's it for the assembly of the main arch box. That is looking like something I'd like to boil with. So now what we're going to do with the door is so put the latch on. How do we know what's up, what's down? Yep. So just pay attention to what you're doing. The door sits on like so. The hinges to the to the right. To the right. So when this handle goes in, make sure that the finger, the ergonomic finger uh, grooves are down. You don't want to have it like this. You want to have it down like that. Right. So then what you're going to do is slide it in through the latch retainer. Two of these washers, in this case I go sharp to sharp, doesn't matter, but I set that over that hole and then I set the latch over the top of it. Now we're going to use, for the first time in this project, a non-quarter inch bolt. This is a 5 16 by 1 inch long bolt. I'm going to put a washer on Drop it through. Then while holding that together, I'm gonna to put a lock nut on the inside. Now you might be saying, Jim, you're putting a lock nut on an area that's gonna get really hot. No, we're gonna have two layers of ceramic fiber insulation on here. That, that nut is not gonna get hot, to, hot enough to melt. So a lock nut has like this plastic... A Teflon, yep. So that's why people would be concerned about that. Now I'm just gonna tighten it on there. Now in this case, I have a wrench on the back side. Okay, this is not a carriage bolt. And I like to have this just a little bit tight. So you can slide the, the, the latch up and down 
but there should be a little bit of tension. It just gives it a better feel. I like that very much. See if I pick it up, it stays. Now is where we employ these stainless steel washers. Position those over the hinge holes. Prepare your last remaining 5 16 bolts with washers up to the head. Drop them through the door. And drop the door onto the hinge of the arch front. Awesome. It is awesome. It is just the coolest. Now we're putting another steel wa uh, zinc washer and a lock nut on the bottom of both hinge bolts. You can actually close the door already. What tools are you using here? Now I'm just using an adjustable wrench to hold one side while turning the, in this case I'm turning the bolt with a uh, half inch wrench. So the, the drive size of 5 16 hardware is half inch. So it should feel good and solid. So now we're going to put the emblem on. So be careful when you open this bag not to lose the tiny hardware. Here's the metal emblem. Here we talk about a very important fact. Made in the USA. Everything. Now this is stainless steel hardware. And these are 632 screws, machine screws. And here we have a nut and a lock washer. Can't really see the lock washer, but it's there. Yeah, it's hard to see, but it's pretty small hardware compared to what we've been using. So now I'm gonna hold that nut and just turn the screw tight. Phillips machine screws. So the emblem is on. Now we're going to insulate it. So you're going to find the small squares of insulation that were packed with the evaporator. And there's, there are two different sizes. So pay attention to that. And I'm going to perfectly center the smaller one over the top of the bigger one. I'm going to make sure that I have my two inch long carriage bolts in reach. I'm going to pack these in there. They go in, they're not too tight, they're just kind of a firm fit. And that's exactly what you want to do. And don't compress all this. You want that insulation to stick out slightly proud out of the door. That makes a good seal when you close the door. So that's just perfect how it is. You can see the four holes that we're going to push these two inch long carriage bolts through. Push all four of those right through. Um, some people like to wear gloves during this process, which isn't a bad idea because the ceramic insulation can, um, so if you have sensitive skin, it can. Um, it, it can be itchy. Yeah. Be itchy. Yeah, it's similar to what you get with fiberglass insulation. It can just be a little bit itchy. And if you're if you're using a lot, like when we when we cut huge amounts of ceramic fiber insulation a lot of times we'll wear a mask because it can be irritating when you do when you're dealing with a lot of it when you're you know high volume of it so now what we're doing is we're putting the fender washer on the inside just to retain that insulation and we're putting a nut on it no point in lock nuts or anything here the, the tension of the insulation holds everything tight and don't over compress this insulation either I'm just getting it so that the, the bolt is sticking through the nut by a little bit. And that's it. The door is insulated. And you, you should feel that it's a little bit tight when you close it. You close it. That is beautiful. Firm. It is perfect. So now you can see some of the details, the perfection of the assembly. Um, this is, a lot of this is taken from the Corsair, which was a, a, a a complete industry changing evaporator. So this is sort of uh, built on that same premise. So let's put the insulation in. Let's start by putting the back piece in. That's identified by the hole. Uh, this insulation can really only go in one way, so there's no big concern about uh, putting anything in the wrong spot. So you'll kind of have to stretch this insulation around this hole. We generally cut ceramic insulation just a little bit big. You should have to kind of pack it into places, okay? Because that's what holds it in there, all right? 
this stuff is really easy to work with. It's, it's very user friendly. So we're, we don't want to compress on the door, but it's okay to compress it here. Well, I don't, I don't want to compress those bolts to the point where we shear it off and cut it because that's mm -hmm. easy to do. A bolt has a lot of power for closing, for, for, mm -hmm. uh, for pinching. Mm -hmm. So that's why I mentioned it before. Okay. But the end, but, but tension fit is the only way that this stuff is held in. We're not gluing it. We're not using any other, any adhesives or anything. So mm -hmm. it has to be friction fit. Yep. What's the next piece? I'm going to put the front in next. And I'm kind of manipulating it around some of that hardware that's in there. I'll do the big side panel first. So the two sides must be identical, huh? They are, yep. So how long does ceramic insulation last? Last years, if you keep the mice out of it and you, you keep it dry, or if it gets wet, you dry it out. As long as you take care of it, it can last years and years. It does not ever break down in terms of uh, heat. The, the fire will never break it down. Yeah, I don't know why mice would ever want to chew on this stuff, but they do. Yeah, they do if they get in the sugar house or in the garage yeah. or wherever the evaporator is kept. Yep. So that's protecting the walls of your evaporator and also keeping the heat inside. Or... And it's making your evaporator last forever. If fire were able to get at these arch rails, it would burn that metal away. Uh, no matter how thick the metal is, fire will burn the metal away. But if you see how this fits, it's the, it's the perfect thickness. It's completely protecting every single bit of that metal. Mm -hmm. So when you're operating this evaporator, you will be able to touch the side of it for a, for a period of time. Um, no matter how long you've been running it, it's, it's not as if it's going to scorch your skin. It'll, it might feel hot, but it's never, ever going to be dangerously hot, like very dangerously hot. So that being hot. said, certain areas of the evaporator do get really hot, oh, so yeah. don't let anyone just walk up and touch the Yeah, the evaporator, evaporator is still, I mean, it's still dangerous. The chimney pipe will be extremely hot. The chimney pipe isn't insulated. That's going to be something where... Especially if a child touches it with, with their tender skin, it'll immediately burn them. It, the chimney is going to be screaming. I've had um, the nylon of my winter coat um, melt away because I was standing too close to a yeah, chimney pipe. I was not even, I was just standing nearby. And So keep children and pets away from the chimney pipe and don't insulate the, the chimney pipe. The chimney needs to be able to expel uh, its heat. Expel, yeah, yeah, that's a mistake that some people have made. They have ins they tried packing insulation around the chimney pipe just to make it safer. Well, what that did is it, it, it trapped the heat inside that metal and the metal actually melted. So yeah, it actually made it less safe. Right. So don't ever insulate the chimney. You just have to build guards so people can't get to it or, or whatever. So the arch is fully insulated. As you can see, that went really quick. Yes, that was so, beautiful. Should we put some fire bricks in? Let's do it. So the fire bricks go in with the grates then. Now watch how I'm doing this. You see the the, uh, the angle iron on, on one end is actually sticking past the brace. Yeah. On this end, the brace is sticking past the angle iron. That's how it should be. So the part where the, where the angle iron grate is sticking forward, that goes toward the loading door. The Dauntless takes 18 fire brick. The first two I'm going to put in go right here. That's why that angle, that's why that brace of the grate assembly is where it is. Okay? That holds these two fire bricks upright. These bricks, bricks actually sit on the angle iron brace. So the grates have to be set in place first. Is there any reason you'd ever have to take the grates out? Uh, while you were... I guess at the end of the season, you might take your bricks out, you might take your grates out and give everything a good cleaning. Mm -hmm. It's the only reason I can think of. Ooh, nice fit. Perfect fit. So I don't know if you saw what I did there, but I put this brick in before the, the center one. So see here, I put that in so I can sort of just press that tight against the insulation when I slide this one in, because it is a fairly tight fit. And if you were to slide that last one in along that insulation you might tear it a little bit mm -hmm. so i'm a little particular on how i do that these are all full fire brick you do not have to worry about cutting your fire brick it's another so, nice feature yeah 
Fire brick isn't easy to cut and it's something you don't want to deal with. So like you said before, the fire brick is not here as an insulator. The fire brick is here to protect the insulation. And you can see that the insulation is very well protected now by that brick. And we're putting it only in the areas where we are going to be putting That's right. firewood. It's, not, it, it's, it's pointless to bring the fire brick up any higher. In fact, it would be counterintuitive to bring the fire brick up any higher because yeah. it would cover the pan. So the fire brick ends down here because you're never going to have firewood stacked this high. This way the heat and flames can get to the pan all the way to the edge of the arch rail. Right. No point in having fire brick back here, so we don't put any. Fire brick is actually sort of a bad thing. The more fire brick you put in, the longer it takes to get started up because all that fire brick absorbs heat. So when you're starting up in the morning, all that fire brick is going to absorb heat from your fire before it can get to your pan. Once the fire brick is up to temperature, once the fire brick is equal to the temperature of your fire, it's not going to absorb anything else. Now all that heat's going to go in the pan. Likewise, though, when you're shutting down, that fire brick stores that heat. That energy is in the brick. So it makes your, your startup and your shutdown more, protract, more protracted, the more fire brick you use. So use as few fire brick as you can get by with. So this is perfect. This is perfect. 18 fire bricks. 18 fire bricks in the Dauntless. Four and a half by nine by one. That's right. A Great. standard, a standard, uh, a standard fire brick. Okay. I've heard of some people putting sand in the, the V's of the grates. You so. can if you want. The, the grates last so darn long as it is. I, I don't think it's much of an issue, but by putting sand in the grates, I'm, what I mean by that is down here, you can fill these with sand just so that the fire can never get to that steel. It's not a bad idea. You can do that if you want to. And that's it. So from there, of course, the elbow goes in here. And you should probably use some sheet metal screws and, and screw that together, however you do it. If you're going in a building, um, you need less support than you would if you're just setting up in your backyard. But from there, your, your chimney pipe gets stacked upward off of it. Yep. Um, so if someone were to put a sheet metal screw in there, they just drill through that hub? Well, most sheet, most sheet metal screws are self-tapping. So whatever type you have, you're not going to have to drill a hole. You'll just run it right in there. Okay. Great. I think uh, that the manufacturer recommended at least three. Uh, three oh, per joint. Yeah. Per, yeah, the stack pipe manufacturer. I believe so. And another thing that I'm going to mention, and this is pretty important, Use all of the pipe that we send you. We send you a total of eight feet of pipe plus that elbow. Use all of it. The only thing that draws air into the firebox is that chimney pipe. The chimney pipe will create a pneumatic draw. And the more pipe you have, the, the hotter the fire is gonna be. So it's important that you use all of that pipe. You might, you might just put two pieces on because you think that's all you need to get the smoke up out of your face. That's not always enough to create a hot fire. So keep that in mind. All of the pipe that we send you should be employed. Can you show how that pipe goes together? Sure. So this pipe, uh, four pieces are going to come packed inside of one another. The joints just interlock. There's a male and female side to this joint, and you can see how that's going to go together. One end always seems to go easier than the other. Ooh, I like that snap. Yeah, once it snaps in place, I just kind of pull it back so that it's perfectly round again. Like so. So we'll do that with all four pieces. And then, of course, there's a, uh, a male and female end that, that go together. So the crimped end goes into the uh, elbow. The crimped end is always facing down. Yep, the crimped end of the elbow goes into the dauntless. The crimped end of the pipe goes into the elbow. The next crimped end goes into the top of this pipe and so forth. Okay, we so we're going to put all four sections of this snap together pipe mm -hmm. together. And then just let, let's pretend that we've done that. Can you show us the guy support? Sure. The last thing you do, let's just say you're up toward the top of the stack assembly now. This unit gets bolted on and clamped. From there, use 
cable or wire or chain or something to run down to the ground at these three points. One, two, three. You can anchor to the ground or attach it to a cinder block. Or... Yep, cinder blocks. I see that a lot. People will tie off to a cinder block or whatever, yeah. Um, I've also seen people attach to um, like an old basketball hoop pole. I suppose, yeah. Uh, so people get creative, but just keep make sure again that you're not setting up like right next to your house. Give a yeah. little space. It's hot. Just whatever you do, make make sure you keep in mind that it's hot. Also on a windy day, if you are wheeling this thing in and out of your garage, it's not set in a building, and um, and you're setting up right outside of your house. If there's a wind coming over the top of, a, of of your house or a building of any kind, if it's windy, that wind can come down and downdraft and push right down the chimney. So if you're having problems with, like if you open the door, you should never get smoke coming out of the loading door ever. But if you are seeing that, if you open the door and there's smoke coming out or you see smoke coming out where the pan sits on the arch, that means you have a downdraft. So reposition, relocate. Um, that, that's typically a wind coming down. It's very rare, of course, that you mm -hmm. that all those all those things happen at once that that make that occur. But it can happen. It's something I've seen and I've I've taken calls on it where people were complaining that the that they're getting smoke out of the door or or it's not evaporating as quickly as it as it should. And and we found that they have a downdraft. That's going to be obvious when you have a downdraft. Right? Having all the pipe on there is going to help. It will help too, a lot, yeah. because that's going to create that pneumatic draw. Correct. Another thing, setting up this arch, you're going to want to make sure you're on level ground, right? Yep. Um, you want to have your pans always level so that the depth is equal throughout the pans. Correct. That's beautiful. Great job, it Jim. It's a, it's a very high quality evaporator. We're, we're just so proud of it, and, uh, and I know you're going to love using it. Reach out, though, if, if you have any questions on it. Um, assembly is completely covered in this video. But if you have any questions, you know, that's what we're here for. Call or email anytime. Yep. We're here. 920-202-4500. SmokeyLakeMaple.com. And this is what it boils down to. This is what it boils down to. Have a great maple season.